Okay, last time we were together, we were in Romans chapter 12, and we just started. And we got through the first two verses, and now we're into the third verse. But we'll, we're going to back up just a little bit, looking at verse 3. Because verse 3 says, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Well, if you go back to verse 2, it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So having your mind renewed has to do with, of course, your thinking. So when he says in verse 3, For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. That's part of the renewing of your mind. Uh, I have had this experience in the past uh, with people, certain people that believe that just because they give up their old religious traditions and started learning grace doctrine, that that's all there was to having their mind renewed. And they, they really misunderstood the point. When you understand the doctrines, the grace doctrines that are given to the church by the Apostle Paul, one of the things that it does to the mind, it renews the mind, but it prevents you from thinking more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Because having your mind renewed by the word of God puts everything in its proper perspective. And you see what your place is. And you won't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. If you, through learning the doctrine, begin to think of yourself more highly than, than you should, or think that somehow you've arrived because you understand how to rightly divide the word of truth, you're sorely mistaken. You are being misled. Uh, you're kidding yourself. There are people, unfortunately, and I see this a lot on Facebook, people learn a little bit about rightly dividing the word of truth they learn some truths, and suddenly they think they're a spiritual giant. And you can't teach them anything. Well, see, that's, that's the opposite of how you should respond to having your mind renewed. Paul, could you turn your video off, please? Thanks. The way that you res the way you should respond to having your mind renewed is you not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to. You should it should make you more humble, not puffed up. You know that was a problem in the Corinthian church, where people thought that through knowledge, that's all there was. It was just knowledge, and they became puffed up, and there was no charity. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. See, knowledge is supposed to produce charity, not make you puffed up. So you're not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Then he goes on to say in verse 3, But to think soberly. Thinking soberly. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse eight says, 
But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. So, going back to Romans 12, verse 3, he says, we, not, we should not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, but to think soberly. You're not thinking soberly if you take on an attitude of superiority because you understand the Bible. You understand some doctrines better than other people. But you, answer, you understand some things about the Bible that other people don't. Uh, and so you become, become conceited. And that's wrong. He says, but to think soberly, according as God, as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. And I think what Paul is trying to communicate there, and oh, by the way, disclaimer, I'm not sure I fully understand everything that Paul is saying in this chapter. So a lot of what I'm going to say tonight will be my opinion. Because I have to admit, there are some difficult passages in here. I digress. According as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. And I think what he means by that term, by that phrase, is that uh, the extent to which you can and should believe what you should believe God for as opposed to what you shouldn't. In other words, Paul's gospel, Paul's doctrine, the letters that Paul wrote, um, that's the measure of faith. The measure of faith, Paul talks about people departing from the faith. In other words, they depart from the teachings of Paul. And I think that's what, what Paul is referring to here in verse three, when he talks about as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. And that measure is, is just uh, following Paul's letters, if that makes sense. If I seem to, to confuse you, let's talk about it after the lesson. So verse 4 says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office now paul segues from the issue of being a uh you know a living sacrifice and not being conformed to this world but being transformed by the renewing of our mind and not thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to think and segues into this issue of how the body corporately is to function together that's why he says, for as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office. So there is that issue of, again, of somebody maybe thinking more highly of themselves than they ought to because of the office that they hold in the church. Or maybe they have a spiritual gift, which is possible because the period of time covered by uh, covered in the, the book of Romans is right around Acts chapter 20. So it's very possible that sign gifts are still in place or some form of spiritual gifts are still being manifested in the uh, early, in the early church. Um, so when he says in verse four, for as many as have, uh, so, so as we have many members in one body, all members have not the same office. And so it's very similar to the issue that we saw uh, when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, Paul was dealing with uh, schisms in the church in Corinth and people uh, desiring spiritual gifts that were not 
that, that, that God did not give them. And so let's compare. What we're doing, we're going to compare these passages in Romans 12, uh, Romans 12, 4, 5, 6, and 7, and compare them to what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 about sign gifts. So let's look that look at that. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter 12, let's start at verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Uh, Let's go to verse 14 of the same chapter. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not, uh, not the hand, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? If the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, am I not the body? Am I not of the body? Is it therefore not the, of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, if the whole were hearing, if where were the smelling? But now God hath set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the, the body? But now are they many members yet but one body and the eye cannot say unto the hand i have no need of thee nor again the head to the feet i have no need of you nay much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary so going back to romans chapter 12 You see very similar language in Romans chapter 12, starting at verse four, because again, the issue is that the church needs to understand it, particularly uh, back when there were sign gifts and spiritual gifts were being given by the spirit, um, that people tend to covet or be envious of what somebody else has. You know, uh, everybody wanted to speak in tongues, but Paul makes it clear in 1 Corinthians that not everybody was to be to have the gift of tongues. Not everybody was to have the gift of prophecy. And not everybody was to hold the same position in the church. But everybody was one body. We all need we all need to work together in harmony. And fulfill the role that God has given you, that God has given me, and the God that He's given you. Sometimes people want to have what what somebody else has, and that's that's the wrong that's the wrong heart attitude, uh, even if it has to do with spiritual things. Um, so we see here in Romans twelve. Verse five, so we being many are one body in Christ and every one members one of another. One person is not above the other person in the body of Christ, okay? We're all just trying to do th different things together to help each other out. That's what it's really all about. Nobody is superior to the other person in any way. Nobody is spiritually superior to this person or that person. We're all equal in the body. Okay. Verse six, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. And again, I think that is like the measure of faith in the 
in the previous verse, talking about the idea of um, operating within the parameters of what Paul lays out in his in his letters to the church. Verse seven or ministry, let us wait on our ministering or he that teacheth on teaching or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerful cheerfulness. She, I can't talk tonight. Cheerfulness. <laughs> So, what's interesting also about this passage is that you don't see the sign gifts mentioned here in this passage, except if you want to count prophecy as a sign gift. But that appears to be the only supernatural gift that Paul mentions here. When you read the rest of it, it sounds as though these are things that everybody should manifest, every Christian should manifest all the time. For example, verse 9, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Well, obviously that's not a spiritual gift, that's, that's behavior that is becoming of a Christian. Uh, but verse 9, he says, let love be without dissimulation. Now, what is dissimulation? Dissimulation is the idea of in being insincere or being hypocritical. Uh, you see that... Um, you see that used in Galatians. Um, in Galatians, uh, where is it at? Galatians chapter 2, if you want to look at that. Galatians chapter 2. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 13, um, it says, And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. And that is talking about hypocrisy. So when going back to Romans 12, when he says in verse 9, let love be without dissimulation. That's what he's talking about. Let love be without hypocrisy or insincerity. It should be sincere. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is which is good. Uh, let me, though, let me back up to verse 8. There are some points I wanted to make about verse 8. I kind of skipped over there. In verse 8, he says, or he that exhorteth on exhortation. Exhortation, that's it's like uh, uh, prompting someone to, to a certain action, to a certain attitude, uh, uh, to exhort someone to, you know, conduct themselves in, in, a, in a proper Christian way in a certain situation. Um, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. When he says he that ruleth with diligence, what he means by ruleth is, I believe, the same thing that Paul meant in 1 Timothy chapter 3. So let's look at 1 Timothy. Chapter 3. 
First Timothy, uh, First Timothy, chapter three, and let's look at verse. Well, let's look at the beginning of the chapter. Uh, it says, "This is a true saying: If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work." A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy, a filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. Now look at verse 4. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity, for if a man know not how to rule his own house how shall he what take care of the church of god so the idea uh, there of using the word ruleth back in romans 12 if you go back there uh, romans 12 again verse 8 when he says he that ruleth with diligence what i believe he's communicating there is that when he says he that ruleth it's he that leadeth because it's talking about a position of leadership and so you lead by example you know not by a horse whip so when he talks about ruling he's talking about leading he's talking about setting an example and knowing how to manage your own household or else how are you going to take care of the church of God? How are you going to fulfill your role in keeping order in the church? Right? It's a leadership issue. And so that's what I think he's talking about there in verse 8. Now, now we went over verse 9 already. Let's look at verse 10. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. Look at Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. He says in verse 9, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So we are to show preference to our brothers and sisters in Christ. So going back to Romans chapter 12. Again, Romans 10, be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love. We're to treat each other like family. And we should prefer one another in honor, preferring one another. Verse 11, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. So he's making a connection here between not being slothful in your business and serving the Lord because those two things go together. Let me give you an example of that. Um, look at Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 5. Ephesians 6 verse 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. In other words, if you work for a company, you're the servant, the, the company owner, uh, company manager is the master. 
And he says, verse 5, Be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. So you're, you're not just doing your job so people will like you and you'll get a promotion. You are actually serving Christ when you do the best job you can possibly do on the job. Whatever it is you do for a living, if, you were, if you're still working, you should do it as though you're doing it for Christ himself. Something to think about. Because he says, verse 6, not with eye service as men pleasers. So you're not, again, you're not just trying to get a promotion. You're serving Christ by doing the best job you can do wherever it is that you work. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, uh, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And that may, the way that's worded, it's possible that may have something to do with what happens at the judgment seat of Christ. Just something to think about. So let's go back to Romans 12. Romans 12, verse 12. Romans 12, 12. Rejoicing in hope. And I believe that hope is the hope that we talked about when we were in Romans 8, the hope of the glory of God, the, the rapture, the day that we're glorified, we put, take on glorified bodies and meet the Lord in the air. So we, we're to rejoice in hope, patient in tribulation. And that's not, the, of course, that's not the great tribulation. That is the tribulation that we all experience from time to time in this life. Patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. I think that's your companion verse to Romans 12, verse 12. So the question is, how do you do that? How do you continue instant prayer? How do you pray without ceasing? Well, I believe it simply means you pray about everything all the time. It's not that you're praying constantly. Like I know one grace teacher, and I, I love the brother. I, I'm not being critical of him. And I'm not going to name his name. But uh, he taught that praying without ceasing meant you always had a, a, a prayerful mind. Your mind was always praying. In your mind, you're always praying about everything. Uh, your, your thoughts were prayerful. You had prayerful thoughts all the time. Well, okay, you can believe that if you want. That's okay. Uh, but I think what Paul is communicating is simply this. You just don't give up praying. You pray about everything. You give thanks for everything, which is a form of prayer. And you just don't ever give up on praying. Some people give up on praying, right? They say, what's the point in praying? I prayed for this and I didn't get what I wanted. But that's not the point. Praying is communicating with God. 
The communication is like this. God speaks to you through his word and you speak back to him what is on your heart. But remember, you've got two ears and one mouth. There's a reason for that. You should listen to God twice as much as you speak to him. So you know how to pray. All right, look at verse 13. Distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. Helping our brothers and, and sisters in Christ with material needs. Look at Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 15, we read, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity. There's that word, necessity, from Romans 12. The necessity that Paul is talking about here in Philippians 4 is material needs, food, shelter, clothing, things like that. Nowadays, we, you know, it could be money uh, or it could be clothing or food or a place to stay, something like that. But that is what he talks about going back to Romans 12. That's what he means in verse 13 when he says, distributing to the necessity of saints given to hospitality. In in, in a desperate situation, we should be willing to help our brothers and sisters in Christ with material needs. So let's look now at verse 14. Romans 12, verse 14 says, Bless them that persecute you, bless and curse not. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse First Corinthians chapter four and look at verse 12. And labor working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it, we allow it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and the offscaring of all things unto this day. Now, most of us haven't experienced this sort of persecution but we may someday and this should be the way we respond when we're reviled we should bless when we're persecuted we should allow it everybody today is screaming i want my rights Nobody's going to mess me over. Well, when it comes to per being persecuted for the cause of Christ, you need to lay down the arms. 
okay? You suffer it. Now let's go back to Romans 12 and look at verse 15. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. That's, I think, self-explanatory. We sympathize with those who are suffering. We, we show empathy and compassion. We try to bring them comfort. Verse 16, be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Let's compare this passage to another passage in Philippians again. If you go back to Philippians and look at chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, Fulfill ye my joy that ye may be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. You can't be of one accord and one mind if you're high-minded, if you're wise in your own conceits. Verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. But in loveliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Again, there's that issue of someone thinking they're superior to another. Someone thinking that they're more spiritual than someone else. That uh, they're somehow spiritually superior. But someone who is really spiritual, a, someone who's generally spiritual, is going to be gracious and charitable. Verse 4 of Philippians chapter 2. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. In other words, we don't speak that way today, but, but what Paul is communicating is that we should care more about what's going on with somebody else than ourselves. And I'm talking about generally caring about them, not gossiping about them, right? But generally caring about the spiritual needs of others. That's being charitable. Verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. People today are looking for reputation. They want to be known for something. They want to stand out in the crowd. And they purposely marginalize themselves. No, you don't do that. He made himself of no reputation. You know, when Christ came to Israel, he humbled himself as a man. He made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And that should be our attitude. 
let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Verse 16 again, it says, but condescend to men of low estate. In other words, what he's saying there is, don't think you're better than somebody else who you think is maybe a little, you know, rough around the edges or uneducated or something like that. Condescend to them. Don't be embarrassed or ashamed to be around somebody who's poor. Be not wise in your own conceits. Now, where have you heard that term before? Can you think of another Bible verse where you saw that phrase? Be not wise in your own conceits. Go back to Romans 11. Romans 11, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. So, first of all, Paul's saying that he does not want you to be ignorant of this mystery. And the mystery, of course, is that Israel has been cut off to, for the, so that God would show mercy on the Gentiles with the dispensation of the grace of God. But if you don't understand that Israel has been temporarily cut off, and God is simply showing you mercy, you Gentiles, when you might be become, excuse me, you might be become wise in your own conceits. Now, what would be an example of that? Well, God is done with Israel, and now we're Israel. God is done with Israel, so now we're better than Israel. Because God is showing mercy to us and he's providing the opportunity to be saved by grace. We're not like those bad Jews, right? That's being wise in your own conceits. And it shows your ignorance of the mystery. So let's go back to chapter 12. And he says, be not a high, excuse me, mind not high things, but condescend, condescend to men of low estate, be not wise in your own conceits. Verse 17, recompense to no man evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men. Verse 18, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place under wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Okay. Couple things about this, these last couple verses of chapter 12. He says, verse 18, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Now, first of all, what lies in you? Who is, who is in you? Holy Spirit. Spirit of Christ. Christ dwelleth in me. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. 
this is what I think is the application here. Because I have the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit should be manifest in my life. Christ dwelleth in me. So it's always possible on my end of things to be peaceable. But he says, if it be possible, live peaceably with all men. If it's not possible for me to live peaceably with all men, it should never be because it's my fault. It should never be a problem that I've created. Let the uh, let it be the other person. If the other person does not want to live peaceably, that's on them. But as a Christian, I should live peaceably. The only way that's not going to be possible is if the other person is not allowing you to live peaceably with them. You follow that? If someone breaks into my house with a gun and, you know, says, I'm going to shoot you. Well, see, there's nothing left, <laughs> nothing left to do. Either you let them shoot you or you shoot back, right? But it should never be anything that you've done. It should never be. It should never be because of something you've said or done that's creating the problem, okay? I think that's what he's communicating there. Verse 19, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. We should never seek for vengeance. We should forgive one another as Christ has forgiven us. Vengeance has no place. Vindictiveness and spite has no place in the Christian's life. Verse 20, therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Now, I think there is possibly two applications here. Okay, one is um, historic. And what I mean by that is, historically, in that culture, um, in the Palestine culture, back in Bible times, everyone carried almost everything uh, they could in a basket, which they sat upon their head, right? Uh, many times people kept themselves warm with only a brazier full of coals of fire, and it was also, also doubled as a stove for cooking. So the objective was to always keep the coals red hot. But if the fire went out, a member of the family would go to the neighbor's house to borrow fire. The more generous of the neighbor, the more coals of fire were put in their brazier keeping coals of fire on their head. It was a way to show your generosity. So historically, I think that's the application. And spiritually, it's a metaphor for just that, that the idea is that the more your enemy hates you, the more good you should do to them. And he concludes the chapter by saying, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And that's the idea. That's the concept. So that concludes chapter 12.